Okay, everyone. Hello, my name's Steve Rosted. Um, and be, of course, I have to do my obligatory selfie with a actual, this is called a camera. You don't make phone calls with it. Um, I was supposed to get from Mark Rutland. He actually had, I did this back in 1984 with a normal Kodak disposable thing that you plan, blah, blah, that's where the story came from. But he actually was going to lend me actually a film camera to do this, but he forgot to give it to me. But anyway, smile. Oh, I have to turn it on first. <laughs> Smile. And I will post that eventually. So, um, Arnaldo asked me to like give this talk that's not real about really about tracing, but um, so I was going to give a talk about making the Linux kernel suck less. So that was the that's the talk, but um, things have happened recently in this uh, current week. And uh, this is Thomas Gleichner, uh giving the first ever physical pull request to Linus Torvalds. <laughs> um, Linus Torvalds, you know, Thomas said, I'm going to send you a pull request. And Linus said, it had better be wrapped in gold with a ribbon around it. So Thomas being Thomas, printed out the pull request, rolled it up, wrapped it in a cold paper, put a ribbon around it, and said, here's the pull request. And then Linus, of course, said, uh, you had better send me an email, too, because you really expect me to type this in by hand. Um, so, uh, this thing isn't, why is my thing not, my thing died. It won't let me go to the next slide. Hit you. Oh, you know what? Is it right there? Oh, so, so I changed the talk to preempt RT, making the Linux kernel suck less. Um, and by the way, because preempt RT, I have to do a shout out for Dan Daniel Bristol. This talk is in um, tribute to him. Uh, thank you, Arnaldo, for having a moment of silence for him in the beginning. So, so uh, the real-time Linux going up is upstream. This merge release, we just saw it right there. And what a lot of people don't know is people are saying, why did it take 20 years to get in? Honestly, it was going in in 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007. It was just slowly going. It was probably the slowest merge uh, request in the world. So it took 20 years to get in. And believe it or not, the real-time, preempt real-time, improved the Linux kernel tremendously. Uh, some of the details will be going down, but Sebastian will be doing it later, or talk later today about some of the details, but I'm going to kind of go over the overview of what this all meant. So first of all, people who are kernel developers, how many uh, people work in the kernel that's in here, kernel developers, at least just looked at driver, writers, whatever, uh, you've seen mutex lock, mutex unlock. Believe it or not, that did not exist in 2004. That concept was not there what we had were semaphores. Now, semaphores are basically allows you to do, have a set of tasks to go into a critical section. In most cases, it was just a single single task. So basically, it was emulating what we call a mutex into the uh, code. Uh, but the problem is semaphores also allow to pass ownership too. The thing is, there was no way to get a concept of what an owner was. So RT requires a owner of a critical section. So we actually had to change, we had to come up with a way, we actually introduced the uh, Linux curl, or the real-time developers, introduced the concept of mutex lock, mutex unlock, um, to bring it in so everyone would use that and not semaphores. And that way we were able to attach on top of the mutex lock, mutex unlock, a way of doing priority inheritance. Without an ownership, you can't do priority inheritance, and, that, and I'll talk about what, why we really need that in the future. So... It was the RT folks that added the mutex and lock and unlock. So just a little history. So when you see that code, you know it came from us. No hertz and high resolution timers. Now, this was kind of a thing. But because, you know, working in the Linux kernel community, we, we all get along so well. And there's never controversy, never drama, never anything. So there is back before in 2004, uh, the tick always ran, which means that when your system went idle, the CPU was doing nothing, and if you're if you're say if you had a thousand hertz, every millisecond it, your CPU was woken up, and um, was uh, what's it called <clears throat> uh, stopped from we had to get had to wake up and do it. So it prevented the CPU from getting into a deep sleep, and a lot of people were complaining about this, especially since at the time uh, Linux was get, going into the databases and power and uh, power management was huge. Uh, problem with data centers. They're saying, you know, electricity costs money. And when the CPU can't get into a deep idle sleep, 
that's incredibly expensive. I mean, it's almost like running, having like a 100 watt light bulb on 100% of the time. So the idea was, why is a tick going off when the system is idle? So no hertz was invented. Now, at the same time, we were trying to push in high resolution timers because real time needed high resolution timers. We couldn't be based off of a tick. If you wanted something to react, you couldn't wait. Oh, the tick is at, you know, the fastest is 1000 hertz, which is one millisecond. So that means without high resolution timers, the best response time you could get from, an inter like from a timer interrupt was one millisecond and then plus. So we were pushing this, but at the time, the, uh, the current, the, the timer maintainer was against the code to get high resolution timers. So Thomas being Thomas, he implemented no hertz that everyone wanted but he made it depend on high resolution timers. So you couldn't have no hertz without high resolution timers. So Linus pulled in both, which upset the timer maintainer. And Thomas Fleischner at that point became the timer, uh, the new uh, timer maintainer. Lockdep. Now, a lot of things about lockdep. I mean, you've seen those splats. And that came from us because to get real time, the people don't realize that the reason why uh, Linux could run on a thousand CPUs today is because in 2004, when we have a single uni processor, we were triggering the same bugs that could only be triggered on a thousand CPUs. I had one bug where it took six CPU, it would take technically six CPUs to hit something that was within microseconds of a window to trigger. And I remember Andrew Morton saying, did you actually trigger this in real life or did you or did you just do this through analysis? Because he says in real life, this is like one in a billion time to ever happen. I said, no, I trigger it within an hour of my test. He's like, how? I said, because the preempt uh, real-time kernel, the way we made spin locks into mutexes, if you had a thousand threads, you are emulating a thousand CPUs. So it's like running a machine with 1,000 CPUs and we would trigger things. So we were kept fixing deadlocks and deadlocks and deadlocks and deadlocks or things that we trigger and it was haunting it. And um, the kernel maintainers are really efficient. They were able to add more lock or more uh, uh, deadlock issues than we could fix. So it was just playing this catch up. And so finally we got down, we had this meeting and we're like saying, how can we do this? So we said, figured out, so we looked at some uh, analysis, Ingo and uh, Peter found this way of, you know, having a way of keeping track of what locks it, the, what's ever taken and what order they're taken. In, and it would trigger when it found a, a way that you had a possible deadlock. So if you grabbed A, B, and then later another task grabbed B, A, locked up would see that and say, hey, there's a possible uh, lock or a deadlock here and would do it. So the thing is people don't realize, oh, when they see a locked up splat, there's a lot of times we see false positive, or they call it false positives. Honestly, every time I looked at someone uh, saying, hey, this is a false positive, I said, no, it wasn't. Locked up found something very, very subtle that you didn't recognize. So I actually have to go back into the kernel, and this is on my to-do list, is analyze all the places that quiet uh, locked up, because I really believe there's a lot of places that they just hit a bug. So if you if you make locked up not see something, it can't tell you if you're doing it right. And I'll show you, I'm gonna go into detail about what those situations are. Everyone knows about the A, B, B, A system. Very simple, you know, you have that. And Say if you have three locks, I mean, it goes, there's a chain here. You can have A, B, B, C, C, A, boom. We all know that that causes a deadlock. Very simple. You see that locked up splat. You're like, ah, oh, I have to change my ordering. But people know it, don't realize it's a little bit more complex than that. For example, if you grab lock A and an interrupt happens, and in that interrupt handler grabs lock A, you have a deadlock. So you, that you have to worry about those cases. So the idea is you put, uh, the lock A, you disable interrupts. So this little purple box I have around is like disabling of interrupts. So you grab lock A without interrupts doing, which prevents the interrupt from happening. So you don't have to worry about a deadlock. Now, let's say you have, you know, you grab lock A with interrupts disabled and then followed you grab lock B. Task two grabs lock B, then grabs C, but it's owned by lock uh, task three. So now, Nowhere does task two ever grab A, and nowhere does task three ever grab B. It's just grabbing C, but interrupts are enabled. So an interrupt happens. And remember, it grabbed lock A. You have a deadlock. So what you have to do in this situation is any time, so once you have a chain, A to B, B to C, whatever, 
Anytime you grab B or C, you must disable interrupts for the whole time. So interrupts must be disabled the whole time to prevent that deadlock. A lot of people don't realize that because they're like saying, how is this, I'm grabbing like getting a deadlock from C. I'm like, C is never taken in an interrupt context. It doesn't have to be. All it had to be was something that is taken in an interrupt context is held when you grab C. Another thing you have to look at is, uh, say if you do allocations. So you grab a lock and then you do K malloc with the GPF or you know atomic. So you know you could have interrupts disabled or whatever, and you could grab the spin lock, or even a mutex. So the system memory is tight. It's got to do a reclaim. So you do a malloc. So it says, oh, I have to do some reclaim. I have to get some memory to free up memory to give it to you. Remember how? Um, uh, I'm not going to pronounce your name. I always call you. Like I said, I can spell it. I'm, I, I can't pronounce check names. I'm sorry. But anyway, um, <laughs> for memory management, uh, we always have things in uh, the files. We have cache for files, and when the files like start, like we, whenever you read the file system, it pulls it into your cache, so you have access to it quicker. But later on, if you have need memory, you got to free that memory. So it goes into it could free things from the file system. Well, guess what? That could grab lock A too. Again, you have a deadlock. So. Here's the same, and it also includes, it has the same chain issue. So A to B, B to C, C, memory reclaim, A, deadlock. So this is almost impossible for a human to be able to go and look at the code and know what needs to be done. That's why locked up was so important for the system. You wouldn't be able to have, like you said, you wouldn't be able to have uh, Linux running on huge systems without locked up, which, again, came from the real-time people who are having so much time, or was always fighting these problems. Another little situation that locked up catches, this is sometimes, this is where I've actually found people I said it's code, a reader-writer locks. So if you have a reader-writer semaphore, a lot of times says readers could be held, you know, like the readers never block other readers. So you could grab reader A, reader B, and some people think you could grab reader B, reader A. I'm like, does this deadlock? Yes, it can. In most situations, no. But once you throw a writer in there, what happens is once a writer is waiting, now all new readers block. So there you have your deadlock. User space priority inheritance. Now, I can't ever do a real-time talk without having this. On my very, very first real-time talk back in 2007 at Ottawa Linux Symposium, I created this slide, and I have to do it in every single one. I think I've shown this slide uh, probably at four or five uh, kernel recipes. Uh, so real quick, for those that don't know priority inheritance, for those who do, just, just sleep. Um, so you have three tasks, A, B, and C. A is the highest priority task, B is the middle priority task, C is the low priority task. C is running along, it grabs a lock, it gets preempted. A uh, preempts C, it goes to grab the same lock, it gets preempted, or I mean it blocks waiting for the lock that C owns. So it says, okay, C run, and then it goes and it gets preempted from B. But now by B preempting C, it preempts A. So you have priority inversion. Now uh, in real-time uh, operating systems, priority, priority inversion always happens. What we prevent is unbounded priority inversion. This here is a unbounded priority inversion, which means you have no way of knowing how long this priority inversion is going to happen, which means you can't have a deterministic system because you have situations that are non-deterministic. So what we do here is we do priority inheritance, which would mean that when C, or when A blocked on C, C would inherit the priority of A and uh, continue on and it's when B woke up, it doesn't preempt C. C gets runs, finishes it, and sleeps. Very simple. And here's the pthread mutex thing. There was a time where Linus Travals did say, like, basically, priority, inverse, uh, priority inheritance will never be in the Linux kernel. Um, he also said, um, I'm never wrong in my decisions. Interrupts. So I had to do my own little drawings. <laughs> um, so interrupts. We have like the CPU is running along, and an interrupt comes in, and it bothers this. It bothers the CPU because it's always like me, 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 and the CPU keeps having it interrupted. Now, there was a I'm not going to say his name, but there was a particular kernel developer back in like 2005 or six, or maybe it was 2006 or 2007 that said, "I'll never allow you like you know." Or let's see, the kernel should never need threaded interrupts. And I'm like, come on, we could do this. Because no, it's a niche thing for you real-time folks. We don't need threaded interrupts. Well, 
A year later, he comes up to me and goes, Steve, how far along are threaded interrupts? Are they ready to go into the kernel? And I asked, why? And he told me, well, we had this customer who's complaining about large latency that every time the hard drive interrupt would go off, it would do all its work. And the hard drive interrupt handler would take milliseconds to process. And that was a huge incident. So real-time created interrupt threads. So basically when the interrupt were to go off, uh, all it does is wake up a thread handler that actually handles the work of the, um, hard, the hardware uh, processing for the uh, interrupt handler. And this way you could preempt it, it doesn't have to bother it, and the CPU could go on listening to its music. Tracing came from the real-time system. So back, um, I think it was, it started actually, we were saying, okay, in 2007, we were going to say, like, we were looking at the preempt real-time patch, looking at what, um, what could we pull into, you know, upstream. And we're like, okay, a lot of people are asking us, because the real-time patch had these, this tracing infrastructure for latency tracing. Latency tracing also had function tracing. Function tracing in the real-time patch was basically, hey, I want to do function tracing. You enable function tracing, reboot the kernel. The kernel will be uh, function tracing every single function when you boot up, you get your traces, fine. I want to turn off function tracing. You recompile the kernel with it off, reboot, and now you don't have function tracing anymore. So I looked into it, I said, we could do this dynamically, and I did talks and things like that. So I remember Arnaldo first took a crack at it, but you know, this code was, like a lot of the code was coming from Ingo, who basically told me he never meant this to go upstream. And if you've ever seen Ingo's code that was not meant to go upstream, it's not very easy to read. But luckily, I was doing a lot of work with it because I had my own tracer that I was kind of hooking to it. So I took the two, merged it. I said, I got this three-month three month project. I said, give me three months, I'll get it upstream. I still haven't finished it. Print K. So a lot of work about Print K, a lot of talk about going, what's going on with Print K. So Print K, you have, um, the reason why we're so interested in Print K is this is, by the way, I was told that they did an analysis of all the code in the kernel. And they found that the Print K subsystem has the most code today, well, not from 6.12, but from 6.11, that dates back to 1991 from the original kernel release. So print K, the main code came from Linus Torvalds himself. It's his way to debug. He says he's never used KGDB. He's never used Deftrace. He's never used um, any of these other debugging tones, although he has used Perf for profiling. Um, but he's, so print K is his baby, which means that he's very particular when you comes to modifying print K. And our issue with Print K was it would like when Print K happened, it had to get the stuff out immediately, always, no matter what. So just before I'm like, let me just I pulled up the you know, old kernel before the, what we did to it, and I kicked off cyclic test. Cyclic test is a thing that just kind of runs up. It just basically goes to sleep, uh, it sets a timer, and when it wakes up, it checks to say, okay, here's the time I woke up, here's the time I expected to wake up. Give me the difference. That's called the jitter, and you could run it for a while. Like this is. Uh, I, I don't even know what I did uh, for the, the options here, but at the end, it shows you the max min. So this was like an average, this is an old machine. Um, the max latency of this was 68 microseconds was the max latency, which is kind of slow actually, but I think I had debugging enabled on this. So I could have make it, I've had it usually down to 20. 20 microseconds is usually what I usually get. So I said, okay, what about print K? So what I did was I kicked it off the GAN and in another window, I did echo question mark to proc this request trigger, which kicks off print K which will then, you know, print a little message. And boom, 34 milliseconds is my latency. This is why we don't want print K to cause trouble. This is why real time could not go into the kernel until print K was settled. So the print K, what print K did was it created threads. So it was the last block of empty. The old print K, I was just talking to John Orgnus about this uh, at Plumbers last week, and he said one of the, also another great thing about print K today, well, he says old print K serialized. So it would send to the VGA council, it would send to the serial council, it said to you know all these different councils, but it was like one after another after another. So uh, it, to get print out, it took a long time if you had a lot of councils attached. Today, it's threaded. It pushes things off threads. It has emergency layover. So if there's like if the system crashes, it could flush everything out right away. So you still don't lose anything on a crash. Um, but the threaded interrupt allows all the councils to be printed at once. So the VGA council, the um, 
the uh, what's it called, the VGA console, the uh, serial console, everything can also all be printed out once and quickly. So it actually makes it faster for PrintK. Now, I heard that actually some of the tests that failed, uh, Sebastian might be bringing this up a little bit later, was because there's been tests that would be detecting, like, you know, make sure, like, you know, this console finished by, by checking from another console. Now the test is saying, hey, this console says it's done. This console says it's still working. Well, we actually, that we the tests are broken, if you ask me. It also could be used from any context, which means it could be used in NMI handlers now, safely. It could be used in scheduler. We don't have to use that print K deferred. If you ever look in the kernel scheduler, you can't do a print K because print, uh, print Ks also usually wake up a, uh, like there's a, it will wake up the KC soft IRQD or it'll wake up work where you do a print K to say any monitors, user space monitors could be like, oh, we want to re read like system D or whatever. It's going to say, hey, print K happened. Do something with it. So we have to do wake ups. But if you do a print K in the scheduler, the wake up grabs the run queue lock, happens that the run queue clock is already held by the scheduler, you have your deadlock. Build speed. So here's a little thing that um, I'm going to talk about, a few things um, that from real time, whatever, kind of, not really real time, but anything. First, 2008, I added F-Trace. So it originally had this demon that would, because one thing about F-Trace, I had to find a way to do turn off um, the calls for function tracing. I had to find all the locations that called function tracing, which was using the M count of uh, the uh, special M count caller that GCC would put in at the start of every single function. So that's how I, I hooked into that to do tracing. But I had to like disable them. But there was no GCC didn't tell me where these locations were. So since the M count caller tells you, oh, here's where I called, I actually originally had this daemon that would look, or just the M count would call, say, hey, here's where I was called, and then later a daemon would wake up and change it. Um, that little situation called E1000E network cards to be bricked, but I won't go there. Just just search attack of the killer F trace. You'll find it. Anyway, um, so I need a way to uh, find these nodes. So to get rid of this demon, because it caused you know network cards to be bricked, I created a Perl script into the build system. It would run obj dump on every single object file, and it would find, oh, here's all the M count locations. And then it would create a assembly, uh, the Perl script created this assembly um, a list of uh, addresses of this. And then I recompiled, I compiled it and then relinked it into the object file. So, so on the build, it would, you know, run this Perl script, obj dump, find things, correct, boom. Needless to say, the build slowed down. A bit on the build. I remember like uh, Thomas coming to me because his t automatic test goes, after I installed your new patches, the build is 15% slower. What the heck did you do? So in 2010, um, record M count was created, which does it in C, which bed everything up really, really fast, written by John Reiser. No relations to the guy that did the file system. <laughs> and we sped up build again. At the same time in 2008, Linus Tervals was complaining about build speed. And this is actually, yeah, maybe it was about the time I was, no, it was before I slowed it down. So he was already complaining about build speed before I slowed it down. So he said, you know, people send us bug reports to the kernel mailing list. And we say, could you bisect it? But they're not kernel developers. They don't have the machines kernel developers have. They have slower machines, and all they have is a distro config. And everyone knows those distro configs, you know, enable everything. Some people are complaining, it takes me 13 hours to compile the kernel. I'm not going to run a bisect for you. So Linus was at Kernel Summit, and he told the attendees there, this needs to be fixed. I wasn't invited. I was a little annoyed because was, I just became tracing maintainer, and one of the topics was tracing. So I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I think Matthew was there. <laughs> Thomas said, hey, we already have a script. Because back in 2004, when I worked for Siemens, uh, they kept giving me a new machine to build, a new machine to build, a new machine build for the real-time work. And I was like, Ugh, I have to go through and sit down to the configs and figure out what things to turn off because I had to do multiple builds and I didn't want to use a distro config. So I created this thing called Streamline Config. So I said, okay, I could automate this. So it would look, it would do an LS mod, take all the modules, then I would walk the make files, find out what 
calls, I, I would also then go and look at the kconfig files for that builds the configs, find everything as a module and turn them off, and then it will give me a new kind of a small streamlined config. So Lena, uh, Thomas told Linus, well, Stephen Ross said his thing. He goes, so I gave it to Thomas. Thomas was like, this is great. This works. This is back in 2004. Linus was like, why is this not in the kernel? So I was, you know, they said, hey, Steve, could you add it, please? I'm like, sure. And this is what became make local mod config. It sped up the build tremendously. People were able to do bisects. And a plus, it hit the slowdown that I caused by ftrace. It went in the same kernel. <laughs> Text poke. This is something that's crucial inside our kernel. And it came from the ftrace code. That was for real time. Remember I said we're doing real time. It was for function tracing to do this. So we needed real time. So ftrace was the first one to actually dynamically change the code at runtime. And the way it did it was, at least on x86, other architectures do it differently. Um, I put a breakpoint. And then I go, then when the breakpoints hit, uh, it comes up, it hits the handler, it says, oh, skip the rest of the, the code, and then jumps back to after the breakpoint. So that means that everything um, where the breakpoint is, those four bytes after, because the breakpoint's one byte, the four bytes after it, nothing's looking at it. Because I do a sync. I add the breakpoint, do a sync of all the CPUs, so now no one sees those four bytes, so I could change them. And then I could put the breakpoint back, and now we have a call to have entry. Now, this, a lot of people said, hey, this works. Let's do it elsewhere. So we created this thing called static branches or static key faults. It has several names, static branches, static key, jump labels. I don't know, we, we're, we're horrible at naming. So if you look into the code, this is actually an older version of the code. The code actually changes. We optimize things, whatever. So if you look at um, what the static key falls. So this is the inside that if statement. So in the if statement, you have static key falls. So you say, do something that you seldom do. So for example, like KVM, when you boot up, you either, you know, it could be AMD, it could be uh, uh, Intel, or if you turn on stats, enable stats, trace points. Every time you enable a trace point, because a trace point uses this, because you don't want anything to happen right away. You want to either do it or you don't do it. So um, when you look at the code right here, this is a no-op. So we actually... We talked with the GCC uh, developers to create this ASM GoTo. ASM GoTo never existed. So we needed this feature. We said, hey, give ASM GoTo, um, which allows GCC to know that this ASM blob is going to jump to a GoTo statement, so a label. So we changed it to jump LES, and now, boom. So before, it would return false, otherwise turning yes or true, and it does so without any conditional branches. So it doesn't put any pressure on like the branch, um, uh, what's it called, the uh, br predictor, branch predictor, thank you. So this really looks like this until you enable it. And that's exactly the same thing the code would look like if you actually use static branch. That's how important stack branches. But to do so, you need to enable config jump label and actually when I joined a new company, I looked at the config of the system and I noticed that config jump label was equal to no. And I actually noticed it in some other distros and stuff like that. I'm like, wait a minute. Because with it out enabled, this is actually some key. It actually does a conditional branch. Now you're doing this all over the place and it could have like probably a 5% overhead to your system. So I asked, you know, wait a minute, why is this disabled? And they said, well, it was analysis was done on it and it get, didn't give any results. So I said, wait, what? So I looked it up and it, I found that when jump label was first implemented, it was, they analyzed it and they said it gives no performance benefit. Be, so, and it's a new feature, let's disable it. And they never looked at it again. Well, this only gives a performance benefit when it's used. When we first added this, it was probably used in like 10, 20 locations. Today, it's probably used in 10,000 locations. So, like I said, when we enabled it, we had a 5% speed up. That's pretty big. So, uh, keep track of things like this. So, <clears throat> today there was a, a condition resked. So, what is condition resked? Uh, this was a little, in the, inside the uh, LKML, there was a little thing about uh, a blow up. At first, people were saying, hey, we have all these preemption stuff. So, what happens is when you compile the kernel with uh, preempt none, 
the kernel does not preempt. So when you're in the kernel and you know you're in, the kernel doesn't go back to user space and it just does a lot of work, it's not going to go back to it's not going to schedule out. So your system has to wait for everything done. This is usually done on servers where they say oh, I don't care about interactions, but what happens is the watchdog timer will say, hey, you've been in the kernel for 26 seconds. Something's wrong. Well, there's lots of places in the kernel that are in the kernel for 26 seconds or more, just doing stuff, a bunch of stuff, and that's going to cause issues. So they put condition resched, which will say, hey, if I hit here, you could schedule now. Just, you know, so if, if someone wants to schedule, schedule, and it doesn't cause the system to go crazy. So people, since there's lots and lots of places in the kernel that could be there for a long time, you know, we have to sprinkle condition resched all over the place. So there's like... Um, what's it called? Like I said, this, this. There, I did a quick search on 6.11. There's 1,455 condition resked sprinkled throughout the kernel. So this is ridiculous. It's totally, I mean, it's like I said, it's a whack-a-mole situation. And someone, there was this one loop where it was like going into thing and someone from Oracle said, hey, I want to create, you know, this start preemptible area and preemptible area so that in non, in preempt none, we could actually preempt in this area. And that's when Tim, Thomas said, no. So here's, I just looked at one of the locations, the BPF verifier. So I'm assuming that the BPF verifier, this function could last a long time because when I looked at the code, it had a condition resched. So this loop could go for a while. And that means, I guess, probably that uh, pro, subprogram count may be from user space. So anything that's doing anything from user space and you do a big loop, you got to basically make sure it's not going to cause trouble, especially if it's a non preempt kernel. So why don't people use config preempt? Because config, config preempt could preempt in any of these locations. It could preempt anywhere. But the problem is that too much preemption could cause issues. Some workloads um, could take a big hit from it. Why is that? Here's the problem with config, like in config preempt RT, where we make spin locks into mutexes. And then we notice that there, you, uh, non real time tasks were taking a big hit in performance. So, Let's say you have task one that grabs a lock. It goes on. Task two grabs the same lock. It blocks. Task three goes to grab a lock. And this is all sked other. This is non real time, so there's no priority inheritance here. Timer tick goes off. It says you need to resked. But remember, this used to be a spin lock on normal uh, vanilla Linux, but now it's a mutex on preempt RT, which means need resked is set. You can schedule another process. So even though this, there's a lock being held, there's this guy. Now we have three different locks, or we have three different tasks now blocked all on this one um, process because we scheduled on a normal timer tick, sked other. This is a sked other task. This is not even really important. It's just a scheduler saying, oh, you've ran out of your quota. Let's schedule you out. Let's schedule something else. So now it unlocks. This guy, next one gets it. Same thing happens. Tiger timer tick comes in, schedule someone else out. So then finally unlocks, and then this guy finally gets the lock, and this finally gets locked. So that's a that's a huge time to have uh, wait for your lock just because you're preempting. This is the problem with uh, preemption, and a lot of times people config preempt does cause this issue. So to solve this, um, Thomas Gleisner came up with the idea of lazy need resched. Now, what's lazy need resched? Lazy need resched is a way of saying schedule if you can, but you're not you don't really have to. If an RT task wakes up. Need resched set. Need resched set means you schedule when you can, immediately. Lazy need resched is timer tick goes off, or you wake up a non uh, real time task where you say, We want to schedule if you're good. So we set lazy, lazy re need resched, and because it'll say, Hey, you're holding a lock, don't schedule right now, let it go. So now it releases the lock, and by the way, I, I this is a, I took uh, for to make these slides. I actually took the slides and actually moved up. So this is actually the, the same length. So I'm giving this is still uh, relative to the previous task. So it unlocks immediately. At that point, it says lazy need resched set. Let's schedule. So it schedules out. No big deal. It doesn't hold any locks anymore. Next guy gets the lock. You know he releases it. He leaves it. Even the timer tick off. It, it released the It released the lock even before the next timer went off. So you see a difference between. Just using need resched for everything and lazy need resched, it drops this time of uh, lock contention. So when you have a very preemptible kernel, it becomes you have a lot of issues. So Thomas was thinking, hey, this logic could work with the condition, uh, what's it called, the uh, condition or condition resched problem, because a lot of people use don't use um, what's it called they use the preempt none because of this. There used to be a problem that the preempt disable, preempt enable was um, 
did show an impact, but they changed that code to use a per CPU variable and stuff like that. So it's actually extremely fast. So preempt disable and preempt enable, uh, they we ran a bunch of benchmarks and we showed that the preempt enable, preempt disable is not an issue. So you don't get any benefit by going to sched or preempt none if you're worried about the preempt enable, preempt disable, making them no ops. They actually uh, are they very, very low overhead at all. And so it's not in, it's in the noise. You won't see anything. That's important because we need that because we're going to make the kernel always preemptible, even when you say preempt none. How does this work? So we have a new thing that's out there. It's not in the kernel yet. It's config preempt auto, which takes the lessons from the lazy need resched of RT. So if you say preempt none, when a schedule tick, it'll set lazy need resched, which means it won't schedule at all. Um, might sleep, it doesn't schedule at all. The only time lazy need resched schedules is when you go to user space. So when you go to user space, you'll do that. When you do preempt voluntary and lazy need reset is said, on a timer tick, it will not schedule, but it will schedule on might sleep. So might sleep now only looks at lazy need resched. And with a full preempt kernel, it just does need resched the whole time. So how does this work? Let's say you have, um, uh, a, okay, this is with preempt, okay, this is config preempt auto with a, a kind of a preempt none. So you say you have your lock or whatever, you go to user space, you'll schedule. So that's where we schedule. Um, if you don't go to user space, you grab a lock, if the tick comes up, you do not, um, you won't schedule at all. But let's say, now here's the thing. Remember condition resched. Why do we have condition resched? Because the system went up for a long time. So now we're in the kernel for like 26 seconds, you know. How do we solve that? Well, here you're allowed one more tick. So we set lazy need resched, and then you go in. You're in the kernel. You're not going to leave the kernel. You're staying in there for a long time. Well, guess what happens? Another timer tick. So at 1,000 hertz, that's one millisecond. You have one millisecond to, you know, basically go back, get out of the kernel. If you don't get out of the kernel, we set need resched, and it acts like config preempt. So even if you do preempt none, the system, after staying in the kernel for one millisecond after a tick, you're going to now be like config preempt, and you're going to preempt immediately, or once, as soon as you can. So that's how we're going to solve this. In this case, we're going to remove all the condition resets from the kernel, so we don't have to do whack-a-mole anymore. But this is how it's going to work. That's it. That was like, what, 30 minutes? <laughs> Questions? Or are you all sleeping? Oh, question up here. Oh, question in the back first. You don't play rugby. Um, so I often want to compile a single file of some old kernel. And uh, then the modern GCC is not compatible with some things in this old kernel, including this stuff that you've added in the preliminary stuff for the compilation, even though it would be compatible with a pretty single file that I'm interested in. So is there a config option in some old kernels to get rid of this stuff that I'm not interested in? Well, wait, if, if it's an old kernel, it wouldn't have the stuff you're not interested in, would it? Well, maybe it's not that old. Maybe kind of middle Oh, I mean, kernel. okay, so the config, I said, uh, the main thing that, the only thing I think I talked about that was the compiler would care about was the asm go to, which is only enabled when you have config um, jump label. I said a lot of people had it turned off. So if you turn that off, it won't touch any of that stuff. Now, the GCC thing, okay, so I basically, I was at GNU Caldrum, uh, two weeks ago in Prague, and <coughs> excuse me, and they, um, I actually complained that I have, like, you know, like for example, I needed to go to like the four, like 414 kernel, and my compiler couldn't build it. So actually, the only solution I do is I download older compilers and compile that way. So I don't have a solution. I'm doing the same thing you're doing. So I complain too, but that's a compiler thing, not the. Comp I mean, we add new features for the new compilers, but that's. It's no, not going mean, to help you. Like in the end, I used uh, um, all no config, and then I add a few configs that I want. Oh. But that's not, I mean, that works better. Oh, really? Um, 
but it would be better to have more options if it was, if there was just something. So one thing you're asking for more config options in the Linux kernel? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all no config is too few options. If I could have some sensible build, but not have, for example, ob jump, ob dump being compiled, then. Oh, it would I mean, ob, I mean, oh wait. The, by the way, the ob dump that's in the old kernel, whatever you could that. Um, the ops jump thing is we don't use that anymore. In fact, actually, the newer comp actually newer compilers create the m count sections for you, so it doesn't even need the record m count. It'll actually, if GCC supports it, it, actually they actually created these sections for me. So the current the Linux kernel influenced the compiler to to be make that work. But again, that doesn't so help you with older kernels. So older kernels do that. You could just turn off f if f trace. That's the only way to do it okay. at the time. Okay, but thanks. yeah, I don't think I have an answer. Maybe that will help. So okay. Okay. Thanks. We had a question up here. Now that RT is merging the kernel, what will be the driving force to improve the kernel? We retired. Find someone else. No. Uh, <laughs> so actually, by the way, just I want to bring up this config auto, preempt auto. This issue here with this preemption, uh, actually, uh, going all the way back with uh, this issue here. Uh, everyone says, hey, preempt RT is in the kernel. On 6.12, we can um, enable, you know, config, you know, preempt RT and get real time. Well, guess what? This code is an optimization. It's, it requires uh, config preempt auto, which is not upstream yet. So the 6.12 version, the vanilla kernel with RT, may suffer some slowdowns, performance slowdowns that the actual real-time patch does not have because we're still implementing this. This was not a blocker for real-time. This was an optimization. So we, that's why we pushed it. But this is still being in the works. It might not be till 6.13 or 6.14 that we get this in. But although Sebastian said he ran some tests and he didn't see the slowdown like I remember seeing them, but I'll have to do some benchmarks. Was there? Yeah, I plan to ask you the status of pre auto, but you say 613 and 614, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and there's a question up here too. So Willie's been <laughs> waiting patiently. He raised his hand first and then got thrown back there. <laughs> oh, it was the same question. Oh, never mind. It was the same question. You just asked it. So basically, yeah. So there's a uh, PJ over there? Or no, actually, yeah, yes. you, you go first. So can, uh, can we now uh, change the optimize static keys to? A negative one, like debug, don't optimize, so people are more ever like, I want this unless I'm debugging something, so it... Like what? Does, like it's now opt-in, like I, like you opt-in to optimize static branches, so instead maybe it should set debug oh, wait, option, wait. don't optimize them, and then... So what do you mean, for like, like what, which is opt-in? Like I'm not sure which, what context you're talking the, about. The static branches. Yeah, the stack branches. Well, I mean, yeah, you, you could, oh, I mean, should it be, you mean default on? Default on and like make it more obvious like you oh. are opting out of something because you want, you have maybe some that, problems with it. That would require a, a yes from Linus because he's always said don't ever opt. Oh, it's always like default no is the normal thing. But you're right, we could actually talk about that. Maybe we should default on this because people don't realize that this is an improvement. This is an optimization process. So that's actually something I can send an email to Linus and ask, should we switch this to default on? Because I'm finding, I actually do, I actually looked at another config that from someone that, you know, was just, hey, here's my config. I looked, I'm like, why don't you have this enabled? And like, do I need it enabled? So, yeah, I, I, yeah people may not know. I mean, if we flip the logic, then the don't disable, uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, don't enable that, would be default N, so it would be okay. I'll with send a patch Linux. and see what, how badly I get yelled at by Linus. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a couple. There's PJ over there had it first. PJ was first over there. Oh, oh. Um, my question was very simple. Why do you even need the config if it's a performance optimization? Is it bigger? Is the kernel bigger? Or? Well, first of all, well, we definitely need the config because it's not implemented in every architecture. Yeah, but... Can, but can you're you right. Can... You could say just enable it when we do. But the thing is, sometimes it's... It's code modification. Yeah. So that's another thing. Some people don't want, some people want for lockdown purposes, they disable all code modification. So um, they don't allow function tracing, they don't allow this. They, you know, in lockdown situations, you may not want this. Okay.
<clears throat> so how does preempt auto, so it relies on the tick to kick it into preemption, right? And you're yeah. one slide. Yes. So if you're running a tickless kernel, how does that work? If you're running preempt auto. Okay. So, so you're right. So if you go into the kernel and uh, I think that was one of the things we're fix working on. I think we do actually have to be careful if you're, um, if you're in preempt auto and you go into the kernel. I'm not so sure if we allow that. Actually, I think um, if it might be, I can't remember what the solution was, but it could just simply be if you're in config no hertz full, because it's only config no hertz full, that's the issue. Config no hertz full can go into the kernel and still doesn't turn on the tick, but we could have it that, you know, if you're in preempt auto, we could just say, screw it, you enable the tick you when you're in the be, kernel. Yeah, okay, no, that, that yeah. makes sense. But that's, that's a good point. I, I remember them discussing, I don't remember what the solution was. That's probably one of the reasons why it's not upstream. Um, as far as I remember, the tick is running as long as you're in user land, so it's only off if you go idle. No, I actually, I, I thought that too until I was talking to Frederick, and he said, no, you could go into the kernel and run in the kernel for as long as you want without the tick turning back on again. Now, if you do something like a sketch synchronized RCU or anything with RCU, then the tick will be enabled. But he was, uh, Frederick was saying no. He actually, because I thought so too, but Frederick said elsewhere, and since he's the author of, you know, No Hurts Full, I just took his word for it. Okay. Uh, back to preempt RT. I'm wondering in which case do I want to enable that in my laptop, for instance? I noticed that some distros has like the low latency flavor. Is it going to replace that? So can you explain a little bit more like how like a desktop user can benefit from it? So I gave a talk in 2009 in Brazil and then I actually take, gave it a, a second time. I think I even gave it here in Kernel Recipes. That was basically the real time kernel. What is it? Who needs it? And in parentheses, not you. So what reason do you need preempt real time? Uh, now, there could be some cases, believe it or not, we've, we've added all this stuff to the Linux kernel because our first um, testers were musicians because back in 2004, they were able to get a really cheap laptop, install Linux, install preempt RT, run Jack, and it ran better than any other system at that cheap price. So I, we used to get bug reports, and I thought that, I'm like, oh, could you apply this? I'm like, hey, I'm not a computer programmer. I'm like, well, why are you using this? He goes, oh, I'm a musician. I'm like, really? That's cool. Because you know, I'm a guitarist. So... Uh, for that situation, I did it. But now I've talked to one of the musicians recently, and they said, we don't even need to enable preempt RT because you guys added so much, you've improved the kernel so much as is, it really does make all our deadlines very well. We have threaded interrupts. We have all this stuff we have. Basically, the only thing that we switch to turn on is the, uh, the mutex, spin locks to mutex and priority inheritance within the kernel. So if you're not stressing the system too much on a normal desktop, you may not need real time. But I have heard some people say that their, des their desktop... Uh, experience is a little bit more s smooth sometimes. I don't know if I believe them, but um, it might just be in their head. So what reason would you use it to turn? Maybe gaming, if you, if you tone it. But I, honestly, for the preempt real-time kernel, it's, there's certain, situ certain situation that Sebastian will be talking about, like industrial things and stuff like that. Yes, it's great. But for the normal home user, eh, threaded interrupts sometimes. I, I enable that. Because you can enable threaded interrupts without preempt RT. Talk up here. I, I think the question probably should be uh, asked the other way around. Uh, what are the remaining cases where one should not enable it? Because if there are some uh, shortcomings, uh, it makes sense to avoid it by default. But if there are no known shortcomings uh, anymore, um, it, adds, uh, it offers another option to run certain tasks for some people who would need them without having to change the kernel. So one thing when you enable preempt RT, you have things like anything that's real time or spin locks. We do actually, the spin locks, we've, we've optimized it really else. But I think if you run benchmarks, I don't know if Sebastian's done it recently. I, I, I haven't done anything recently, but there is still a slight performance hit from the preempt, preempt curl. So um, if you just care about performance, and I, I, told the, I, I quote the term, I created the term saying that real time gives you the fastest worst case scenario. So it's, if you're worried about worst case scenarios, real time is the case. But if you're worried about just throughput and you don't care about outliers, real time is not going to help you. So 
it's it's just really weird that like, you know like I want people to know that you know I don't like I don't want to sell something and people saying why is it not faster because you know, Paul McKenney used to give a talk you know real time versus real fast and it's like they're not equal so real time does not give you real fast in fact it's usually the opposite so, so typically it will probably not be enabled on uh, enterprise kernels for example was it oh like a hypervisor uh, on uh, enterprise kernels enterprise distro kernels probably it will not be enabled by default right no this will not be de- okay. I, I i would suggest not enabling this by default that's mm-hmm. like i said you should have your own little situations but i don't please distros unless you're i mean you could have some like suzy i believe has like you know he has he has a you know kernel and a kernel rt mm-hmm. so if you want the real time kernel on your distro they have an option okay. but it should not be the default to for the normal you know use case Be enabled at runtime <laughs> because there was an option to do this, right? To change your uh, the, 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 this config preempt auto does not change the config preempt auto RT because that means you have to turn. There is a lot of logic that we do. Spin locks turn to mutexes. We don't do that with uh, preempt auto. We could with dynamically code mo- modifications. We could do that, but the question is: Is there really a demand to do that? Yeah. There's a question back. Um, my question is about like uh, as is on auto, we rely on the ticker, and uh, does it break some API like the randomness of uh, the kernels? Because if you know that the dirty mini is like every millisecond, we go back to user space, and uh, would it well, by the side effect of breaking the randomness of uh, even if you don't have a hardware one? So it does it break the randomness of the? Um, You mean like what, like the speed that, you know, the atro, atro, what is it called, the atropy? Well, the entropy, basically. Yeah. But no, I don't, I don't see how it would uh, for randomness. I mean, you don't go back to user space. You just get preempted when you, like, it, it's no different yeah. than hitting it. It's no different than if you hit a condition reset. True. Yeah. So basically, it emulates when that, when that one millisecond ch- triggers, it's equivalent to hitting condition reset. It's the same thing. And we actually, uh, Sebastian did a bunch of tests, and it, he, it doesn't seem to break anything yet. So it seems to be everything works smooth uh, during this. Um, I'm, I have an extension to preempt auto mm. that I will set, that I, I set patches to, and it's funny, it's only like 30 lines of code. It's really, really small. And what it does is allows user space to say, hey, I'm in a critical section using RSIC uh, from Matthew Dinoy. Um, so you can set a bit there saying I'm in a critical, or a counter, and say I'm in a critical section when the lazy need reschedule is set instead of going to, because right now lazy need reschedule will always force the schedule going back to user space. But what I did was if this bit set, it doesn't force the schedule. It allows you to continue in your critical section and you get one tick to get out, to basically go to the, go back to the user space by calling sked yield. Um, and if you like, so once that one tick happens, then it forces a schedule. This way it gives you one millisecond to get to unlock your lock. So you have one millisecond, you know, if you're in that critical section and you want to release it, this way you don't get, you don't hit the same problem with preemption. That's a lot of times like user space spin locks have issues with being preempted. Now, Peter Zilster said, well, what happens if you have some malicious task that just sets it? And I'm like, I just want to always run. Well, the Uh, EEVDF, remember this is for SCED other tasks, EEVDF, which is the earliest eligible deadline, virtual deadline for a scheduler, that eligibility means that if you run more than you, like your uh, allotted time slot, your eligibility will drop. So if you set this bit, the EEVDF schedule will start punishing you. So yes, you may run a little longer, but you're going to run less often. And in the balance of things, you're not going to get the CPU any more than anyone else. So... This is something I'm looking at. I have the codes. Once preempt auto's in, I'm pushing this upstream so that user space could now say, set it. And also VMs could do it too. So a virtual machine could, either, could use the same code to say, hey, I'm, I have a, uh, my uh, what guest kernel has a spin lock. I'm going to set this bit to let the host know, don't schedule me on a timer tick. Thanks. Yeah, follow, follow up question to this. Um, how would the guest then know that it's his last chance to free the lock? So you mean basically when it, when it you mean not free the lock, but basically to say I got extended time? Yeah. So that's actually, so it's going to be as a 64-bit or a 32-bit counter. 
where the first 31 bits are counters, so you allow nesting. So every time you grab the lock, you'll set a bit, set a bit, or you'll, you'll increment it. So whenever the kernel says, oh, this is non-zero, we'll give you time. But when it does give you that extra time, so it says I'm going to preempt you, it will set that, 30, that, that 31st bit, or the 32nd bit. If you start from zero, the, mass, the most significant bit, it will set that. So when the user space goes to decremate it, it will say, oh, the kernel gave me extended time. Let me call a system call to say, okay, kernel, schedule me. Thanks. Oh, that's it. Thank you very much. Actually.